Good evening and welcome to the Hawaii Theatre Center. I am Dave Moss, the Executive Director of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. And you're tuned in to Tuning Up with Dave and... Iggy. Iggy, how are Hi, you? Dave. <laughs> Good to see you again. Well coordinated this evening, I have to say. Clothes-wise? Yes. Well, in the blues. In, in the, the blues. In the blues. And Spencer, a wonderful job again with the, uh, the backdrop here of the Hawaii Theater Center. So. And are the points that are new? They are not new. They were at the concert, and great job at the concert. I usually, um, I've been performing, I've been lucky to perform, but uh, this past week, uh, my uh, colleagues were on the stage, and so I, I very much enjoyed the concert. It was my first time. Uh, logging in on the computer device <laughs> and looking at the concert on the screen and seeing all those beautiful players and making beautiful music. You were and beautiful speech, Dave. Oh, why, why thank you. Um, before we go too much further here, <laughs> I'd like to introduce our wonderful guest this evening, Alina, who is one of our associates, the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra Associates. Welcome, Alina. Thank you so much for joining us. Are you ready for this? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about you and the associates. Let's start with the associates sure. because it's probably a group that not enough people know about, but I know that there are a lot of associates tuning in this evening, so hello to the associates. Yep. Definitely a shout out to the associates. So the associates are a volunteer base for the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. Um, it is um, membership driven, so you do pay an annual fee, um, but it comes with a lot of benefits of um, discounted or compensated tickets, discounts on HSO merchandise. Um, we have the great privilege of supporting the HSO through backstage events, um, annual HSO musicians appreciation Thanksgiving dinner, and some other community outreach efforts like at the farmer's markets and other kind of Oahu-based events. So it's a great way to get involved, um, be exposed to the music um, and the musicians and just kind of um, support each other in our love for classical and performing arts. And little did you know that backstage would then take you to center stage uh, on Tuning Up yes. here. And not just uh, to our box office through the Hawaii Theater Center this evening, but we have people tuning in on Facebook mm -hmm. and I believe YouTube this evening maybe, or maybe just Facebook, I'm getting some head nods. Um, so welcome to those tuning in on Facebook. We invite you to join in in the conversation. Uh, you may text us at the number below here uh, and ask questions about what's going on at the Hawaii Symphony. We'll even take questions about the Hawaii Theater Center. We will certainly take questions about Alina and we and the associates yes. as well. And if you're interested in joining the associates, uh, we can make that happen as well. In short so, order, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Iggy, what has your interaction been with the associates during your time here? Well, I'm, I'm glad we're f featuring that group because you think of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra and you think, of course, of the musicians that you see we're sort of the window dressing. Um, you think of the management, the staff, Dave Moss, executive director, and a few others, key members on the staff. You think of the board, our wonderful board. Um, but you don't always think of the associates, so these uh, very the strongest supporters of the symphony. And whenever the musicians need something, you've always been there for us uh, when we needed you know, to celebrate a musician's birthday, you were there um, backstage with a little glass of uh, juice or no, sometimes not just juice. Um, and we, you know, Thanksgiving, uh, the Thanksgiving week, uh, everyone should know that uh, um, the associates are making gift towards the musicians. There are, they have been uh, uh, giving them um, meals through, dare I say, zippies, mm -hmm. um, through gift certificates, gift cards. So that is uh, from the associates to the musicians. So uh, thank you so much for your uh, contribution and generosity. And I remember when, when Joanne Falletta, uh celebrated her birthday, uh, you were there as well. And so many things. I know we had a few years back the Youth Talent Pool, a competition for... Uh, kids, and hopefully uh, sooner than later we'll have something like that. And it was one of your members uh, through this associate, excuse me, 
and that organize all this. So a lot of events, very eclectic. Um, and you're not always visible to the eyes of the regular audience, but uh, thank you. Thank you so much for all you've been doing. Yeah, I mean, we definitely don't need to be front and center, but we love being kind of, you know, behind the scenes, helping enable all these events and these outreach um, efforts. So, yeah, we love being part of it. I've heard so much about the Thanksgiving party every year oh, yes. and all the people involved in that Marilyn Katzman of course Gene McIntosh um, all of the associates uh, Dr. Lim uh, all of these people who have thrown it it sounds like a pretty raucous party um, every Thanksgiving and I remember when I first got here in March one of the first questions as the pandemic was setting in here was how are we going to do Thanksgiving? How can we find a way to support the musicians and show them that we're still here and we still care about them, no matter if they're here in Hawaii with us or if, on their, if they're still on the mainland? Um, how can we do something? And the associates just really rallied together, and it was really heartwarming to see that nothing can stop them. That's right, because oh. Alina, in the past, in previous years, the Thanksgiving dinner was a big celebration with everyone yes. together in one big ballroom. Yep. Um, at Studio 99, I think, or 909. And, um, I mean, the associates go all in with buying mass amounts of food, um, plenty of wine to go around. There's always bottles left over. And I always like to man that station because that's the funnest station. Um, but it's just a great opportunity because it's not just for the musicians. It's for their families as well. Right. Um, so it's a way for us to show our appreciation to them for the season and, you know, all their hard work, the talent they put in to put on these awesome performances, um, you know, concert after concert. So it's always an event we look forward to. It's always, um, you know, I also want to acknowledge Nancy um, Askew for being involved as well. Um, She's always asking the question, how do we make this better, better, better? And it does get better every year. So. And this year, unfortunately, we couldn't get together. So. Mm -hmm. And we still, and we didn't want to use COVID as an excuse to not keep up with that tradition. So we found a way with Zippies um, through Marilyn and Nancy to um, still support our musicians this holiday. There are so many people in the associates that uh, we should acknowledge, but uh, the list is very long. It but is. Uh, I've known uh, many of them for a long time. And you were mentioning something interesting that uh, we musicians are busy performing and rehearsing and working, and uh, and sometimes we don't always take the time to to meet and have a conversation with with all of you um, on the associates. And so I apologize because uh, I know sometimes we just uh, you know as professional musicians sometimes we get a little bit self-absorbed. Uh, you know you finish your work and you just want to go home and practice or kind of unwind. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's important to take the time and, uh, and, and get to know all the moving parts of the symphony. Yes. Right, Dave? Absolutely. So the associates, can we go a little bit further back than that? So let, what, let's start at the beginning. Uh, okay. um, the genesis of the, Alina. Yes, the genesis <laughs> oh, no. of, of Alina, all the way back to 1989. Um, <laughs> oh, no. And... What led you to join the associates a few years later? Let's take us, take us back to the beginning. Um, I think my exposure to music started very early. Um, my dad was insistent on my sister and me taking piano lessons. So that was kind of um, my introduction to the world of performing arts and classical music. Um, Sorry, was that here? Or? Oh, no, this was on the mainland. And I was a military brat, so we moved around a lot. But piano was something he was very consistent with. So we grew up playing piano, and then in middle school, I signed up for orchestra, and I said, I'm going to play the piano. And the teacher said, I don't have a piano part for you, but I don't have anyone in the viola section. So here's an instrument. It was a Thursday, and she's like, just take as long as you need to learn this instrument. No guidance, no teacher. And then I came back on Monday learning how to play, and she was just kind of astounded. But um, I've been playing viola through middle school and high school, um, provided all these opportunities to just perform it you know, beyond the school concerts and things like that. Um, and then it just kind of stayed with me throughout my adult years, um, mainly because my aunt, um, she is a piano and organ player. She teaches uh, vocal lessons. And so I could just see this enrichment in her life that could be tied back to music. So it just left that impression on me. Um, fast forward to four years ago when I moved to Hawaii, and within three weeks, I was telling Dave I just volunteered for the orchestra and have been with it since. That's amazing. Now, may I ask you, you said 
uh, mainland, you said DC area? Mm -hmm. So um, when we look at you, we think that you're Hapa. Oh, yes. Right? So um, uh, where am I getting to? <laughs> Um, this is the Iggy moment we were waiting for. <laughs> no, here's where I'm getting to. This isn't the Thanksgiving joke, is it? <laughs> no, so um, I'm looking at your last name, so I'm, I'm assuming that your dad is the Korean? Oh, uh, so my maiden name is Kangas, which oh. is Finnish, and that comes Finnish. from his, his side, yep. And then my mother is Korean. Um, I got married in January 2019. Um, to a Chinese man, Darren Ao Young. So okay. that's where Ao Young is coming from. So the musical part was from the Finnish side or from the I can't Korean s side? You know, I would, if I had to pick probably the Finnish side, ironically, because you would think, you know, the Asian mother and the piano, you know, stander for the right. kids. But it, it wasn't coming from her. It was coming from my dad. But I think it was because he was inspired by his sister, oh, my aunt. Great. Yeah. Now, one last embarrassing question. <laughs> um, so... You know, when you hop on in Hawaii, it's just natural, mm -hmm. right? But, um, you, well, you're in the 90s, I guess, growing up as a hapa person in the D.C. area. Yep. No big deal or kind of funny or? Uh, no big deal because the diversity there is so rich. So you definitely felt included. And um, I definitely didn't have to struggle with any kind of validation for who I was and my ethnic background. So that was, that was a true gift, because I know that's not the case for a lot of other people. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, we, I just, I, I'm looking at the questions we're getting in here. So um, someone's writ written in, so she's a plant then, another viola player. Um, this was, I did not know this until oh. you, you, you just told us that you were, this, this is not a ruse from the, the violist uh, in the room here. Wait, it's only I'm sorry, another what? A, what? Another violist. She's a she's, right, but the, the what did this? She's a plant. You know that we've all I've done is um, in, oh. you know asked violists to join oh. us. <laughs> a seed. A seed. Yes. Yes. No, that wasn't wasn't the case. Do you have any good viola jokes? Because Iggy doesn't let me tell them on on the show. I don't, but please tell them. <laughs> oh, oh, good. Um, what what do you call ten thousand violas at the bottom of the sea? A good start. 10,000 violas at the bottom of the sea. <laughs> it's cruel. It's very cruel. <laughs> Everyone's laughing. I don't know. So the reason why I don't tell viola jokes anymore is because I got so tired of it. Oh, and, you, and, 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 and also, okay, so when you grow up in France, you make fun of Belgian people. <laughs> That's true, no, right? Uh, so, the exact joke that you could have for a viol viola player, you know, like, I don't know, I'm not going to get there. It would be the exact same joke you would find for Belgium in France. I see. Right? Or even like a blonde joke, right? I see, yeah. So, um, anyway, after a while, you, you know, here's the real story. The real story is so I would tell the jokes to a viola player, mm -hmm. but then you, they would laugh. My viola, viola friends would laugh, right? But at the corner of their mouth, right, that laugh, that smile wasn't going up. It was going down. So the more I would tell jokes, the more I saw that corner of their mouth going down. And so after a while, I thought maybe I should stop. But do you have another one? I mean, I I have tons, um, but for an, for another show, um, I you know I yes. What's the answer? <laughs> it's a good start. There could always be more. There could more violas in the bottom of the sea. Maybe oh ten. my <laughs> gosh, that's so. Cr <laughs> it's very cynical. It is. It is. It is. Um, do you still play the viola? Oh no. No. Okay. All right. I was I was hoping for like. <laughs> An amateur viola choir to strike up here. Um, something I'd like to do in the future, but um, yeah. Uh, what was it about the symphony that really, why the symphony? You know, there's, uh, there's an opera here, there's a couple of, there's a wonderful theater here. Yep. Um, what was it about the Hawaii Symphony that, that drew you to, to engage with the organization? I think it was just the familiarity of the symphony, you know, being a viola player um, and, a, and a piano player as well. Um, and I was glad that that was my first and early introduction 
to Hawaii because, I mean, the associates group, I mean, you both have been impacted by them on a personal level. They're just so hospitable. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them know what that transition is like from moving from the mainland to um, Hawaii. So they became my, like, ohana away from home kind of thing. So yeah. I, I had no reason to ever just leave or, you know, just want to throw myself in more and more. Yeah. Yeah. I have two stories that I, you know, I've only been here such a brief time, but I have two stories about the associates that, um, that I like to tell. And, and, you know, the first is, you know, again, with the pandemic and everything, we weren't able to meet. And still, the associates found a way uh, to make my wife, Catherine, feel so at home here and had a lovely pauhana that uh, in, in her first couple of weeks here, virtual, of course, but still really showed that connection and the importance of that ohana that the associates really create. And, and then going back even in further, and uh, I'll try to get through this one at the moment, but back when I was interviewing here, um, my wife had a schedule as well during my interview day. And it was actually uh, the associates who took my wife on a tour of of Honolulu here and, and kind of showed places that lived and what the na neighborhood would be like and and just what life could be and uh, Natalie Mahoney and, and and George took my wife around for I think it was four or five hours all throughout Honolulu here to show her what life could be like and it was really that that welcome from the two of them that was one of the big factors um, mm -hmm. in my wife saying, yeah, let's, let's do this because that community was there. Right. And that was the first, first time we felt that from the very beginning. So thank you to Natalie and George. Uh, you're one of, the, uh, one of the reasons we're here today. So I really am grateful for that. And Alina, you've talked to most of the associates. Um, and you all have different tastes, but uh, is there a common thread? You, I mean, obviously you all like the, the symphony, but to, to, in order to join the associates, you can be as different as, as the, your neighbor, right? I mean, it, it doesn't take one kind to be an associate. You Correct. talk to all of them and they all, all have different tastes and different backgrounds? Um, I haven't gotten into deep conversations about different um, preferences of music, but I would say ours is pretty varied for sure. Um, and I think that is great for the associates so that we have someone who's familiar with maybe one type of genre versus another. And so you get this breadth of um, music um, interest amongst the associates, which I think is great. Very good. And, and you actually moved here to Hawaii a few years ago mm -hmm. um, to work with uh, in the education department or you know, a private school? Or? No, I was working for a consulting company. Um, I started in D.C. and then there was an opportunity to join a project out here in Hawaii. So I just kind of took that opportunity and then um, have been kind of working in the local market ever since. So, And you still have family. I guess you're married here, but you have family in D.C.? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to ask you to uh, Dave and uh, Alina, uh, since we're this is uh, Thanksgiving week, um, the, the meaning of it, because this is my experience. You know, I, I was a uh, long time ago before you were born, and I'm actually not kidding. I think it was pretty much before you were born. Uh, I was in college. And um, I had no idea, you know, grew up in France. I had no idea about Thanksgiving. And so my friend, because I had maybe one friend, uh, invited me for, <laughs> uh, to Thanksgiving at his dinner. And I said, sure. And so I went. That was Indiana, Bloomington, Indiana. We drove to Valparaiso, uh, mm. outskirts of uh, Chicago or even Gary, Indiana. Um, well, more like Chicago, I think. And... <laughs> um, and so this, this, uh, his whole family was there, extended family, and this big dinner, and this huge turkey uh, on the a, on a, you know, living room table. And, uh, and my friend tells me, okay, my, my dad's going to tell a prayer, but he's going to go around the table and please introduce yourself and tell everyone what you're grateful for. And I was like 17, 18, and I was just you know, a little young, brash, didn't care young boy, not very respectful, and, and I'm looking at this huge turkey, right? I'm like, should I be grateful for that huge turkey in front of me? And, you know, I didn't know the meaning of it. But then, of course, you know, I, I heard all my friends and, and their families, you know, what they're grateful for. And so, you know, I, the first thing that came to mind was, you know, my family, my parents. And, and so that was sort of my introduction. I hadn't no idea what it was about, and so I, I've done some reading since then. I know a bit more about the meaning, but uh, 
since we with some true Americans uh, today <laughs> here, uh, maybe can you tell, maybe educate me or enlighten me, please, about your Thanksgiving experience? And, and especially you know, this year. Oh, please. I insist. <laughs> you know, I don't think I've really... I don't think I've really thought about it that much. Um, so this is going to be very off the cuff. Um, I'll do better. Yeah, right. Um, unlike the rest of this evening. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, Thanksgiving, growing up, it was always this, this story of the pilgrims and the Indians coming together to share a meal, which um, I think things that I've learned throughout the rest of my life maybe weren't, wasn't exactly true. Um, but, but I, and I think that it's become this holiday that's about family. It's kind of the kickoff of the holiday season. Mm -hmm. Um, it's become very commercialized, obviously with, with Black Friday and all those sorts of things. Um, you know, I I don't come from a a very large family. So at, at Thanksgiving, it was really just kind of uh, one of the handful of times that my close family got together. But it was always a place where, you know, a lot of friends came to my family Thanksgiving. I mean, people, yeah. So I don't really know if that's what you were looking no, for. No, I mean, you know, it's, it's not a religious holiday, unlike many others. I mean, so I think that's why I think there, there's, a, there's a special draw because a lot of my friends who are religious, who are not religious, enjoy this holiday. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know, Alina, would, would, coming from a military family? Maybe? Oh, yeah. That has special meaning, maybe? Um, being a military brat, I think for the first 10 years of my life, Thanksgiving was spent in a mess hall with other you know, military people who were stationed elsewhere away from home. So a little kind of like depressing. And then when we finally settled in Maryland, you know, we had family in the area. so. That kicked off the tradition of having Thanksgiving with the cousins, which you know was an awesome experience. And now, um, fortunately, I have great in-laws um, who I can continue that really close family mm-hmm. kind of connection with, especially Thanksgiving. So it's always been about you know family and just being really grateful for what you have, even through kind of transitions in life. Right, and uh, you know, I was just re- doing a little bit of reading, and, and I'm looking at uh, what you mentioned, but maybe the first Thanksgiving there in 1621, and I'm thinking. Well, who were the composers around that time? Yeah. Uh, and so I have to look. It's, in terms of music, it's the Re- Renaissance period, maybe something you're familiar with, uh, and, and maybe something like John Dallin or yeah. Monteverdi, Frescobaldi, which we don't quite perform here because the Renaissance is before the Baroque, so they didn't write too much for, for uh, a Baroque orchestra. I'm just thinking maybe, you know, this pretty far-fetched, but maybe the, the pilgrims were maybe listening to John Dallin, maybe? I don't know. Is it possible? Maybe too early? I don't know. It may have been a bit too early, I would say, but that sounds like a really interesting dissertation for someone <laughs> to write the classical right, because you, music of you the You think of Christmas, you think of Easter, there's a plenty of, of oh, yeah. religious yeah. music. but uh, And there's no Thanksgiving songs, really. Exactly. Yeah. I was Googling, whoops, uh, I was search engineing uh, uh, Thanksgiving music, and um, I think there was, um, I don't know, some pop singers came out and, and things yeah. like that. But uh, anyway, a new genre of music. This year, of course, is going to be a little bit uh, different. Maybe birth from like the early American composers, just because Thanksgiving is such an American holiday. Ah, uh, good point. Yes, yes absolutely. There's um, there's actually a really interesting Benjamin Franklin songbook um, that's really is that Petra? it. Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, there's a couple of, of our early founding fathers um, that were very prolific amateur musicians mm-hmm. and interested in, in that type of music and um, some really interesting collections of music that they had. Um, I'm sure you can Google it. Then. We'll just bring it out for next year, too. Yeah, bring it out for yeah. next year. Yeah. <laughs> Alina, I, I wanted to ask you... Um, Usually you get together with the associates, uh, meaning, but uh, how has it been going uh, with the pandemic? Do you meet uh, um, on, on, online? And, and, and so we have orchestra committee meetings, we have board meetings. What did the associates, um, some of your topics that you discuss? Yeah, well, 
Um, we definitely keep up with our monthly meeting over Zoom. Um, and I know that Zoom might be a challenge for some of our associates. So we're always diligent about sending up follow up notes afterwards so that people can stay kind of plugged in, updated on what's going on with the associates and the HSO. Um, some of the topics we cover are kind of treasury balance. Um, what else can we do for the HSO, especially during this time? Um, and now we're starting to get into the conversation of how do we um, go about our membership drive that we do every year? Um, and given the complexities of COVID, how, how are we going to kind of go about that this year? So um, The reach out? Or? Yeah, outreach, marketing. Um, I always update the brochures for the associates every year. So I actually need to do that. But um, that's what we would leverage to um, get people familiar with the associates and have them join. Mm. And, you know, in past membership drives, we would use backstage events like rehearsal um, events as well to invite people so they can kind of see it um, for themselves on what the orchestra is like. And that's a great way to recruit new members. What has been one of your favorite memories of being an associate in the past four years? Oh, my goodness. I don't think I can pick one, but like the two things that stand out are, you know, having a few of the associates be part of my personal milestones, like coming to my bridal shower and even attending my wedding. Um, but the one, the event that I love volunteering for are the backstage events because, I mean, Saturday night, you're begging people to leave backstage by 11 p.m., right? They don't want to leave. You have the DJ going, you have wine pouring. So um, it's always a great time to just kind of commingle with the musicians. DJ and wine backstage? Yes. Wow. Yes. Where do I sign up? For <laughs> um, I, I've noticed, because I, I am an honorary guest, I feel like, at the associate meetings. <laughs> um, and I do feel quite privileged to be there because it, it's such a, an electric group of people so interested in helping and just curious about what is going on at the symphony. And... Um, We've been talking a lot about the performances, the the Sounds of Resilience performances. So I know Iggy was an audience member this week, and yes. you've been an audience member for a number of them. What's, what's your impression of this move to digital programming? I just love um, this new way we're reaching out to people that we hadn't done before. Um, and you've even shared that we've had attendees from other islands, mm -hmm. um, which I think is fantastic because I think that's always been a challenge. Like, how do we reach out to people on Maui or Kauai or Big Island? And so to hear them be appreciative of being part of this, especially live, is a huge opportunity for us, I think, in the future. So seeing that innovation um, has been pretty, pretty incredible. And not just uh, neighbor island. I think uh, I have mainland. some friends from uh, Vancouver and I, Paul, and Hi Kumi, and, and yes, on the mainland as well. And mm -hmm. it's been a, a good source to reach out to all the audience. Yeah, and just the thought of having a replay option in case you can't make it to the you know live performance yeah. on your device. So that's that's awesome. Yeah, Vicky, what did you think about the performance this past Saturday? You know, I was able to enjoy it. Just as a supporter of music and supporter of the orchestra. Um, sometimes, I think I mentioned it last week, when we listen to music that we're familiar with, we have a critical ear. But the, the thing I enjoyed the most was just be able to relax. And, and there was a lot of repertoire that I didn't know. I, didn't, mm -hmm. I knew some of the uh, flute concerto. I, I knew the last movement. I didn't know the first two. Um, I didn't know the uh, your friend composer from Chicago, Anna Klein, mm -hmm. Anna Klein, and, and so it was. I thought it was very well done, Donard, Greg, done, uh, very good job. Thank you very much for making it look very professional. Uh, the sound quality was uh, was very good. Um, it was very colorful, and it was. I thought it was very engaging, because uh, you know it, it wasn't like you're watching fireworks on your TV. You know that's the most um, dull thing you could do. Uh, but watching, watching the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra uh, through this, uh, this um, um, uh, live stream, I, was, I thought was very engaging. Um, I, you know, the, the most frustrating part was not being able to clap or being to the musicians. But uh, I just, Did you clap? I'm curious. Um, I, well, my wife and I were sort of 
cheering. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. My, my wife does great cheers. So, really? Uh, yes. So I've always wanted to do, like, a director's cut of one of these where, like, it's Iggy watching the performance <laughs> and, like, narrating it and, like... Yeah. No, I mean, but I, like I said before, I think uh, just being able to enjoy the performance without having a, not through the lenses of a, of, uh, of a you know, professional musician, I think that was the most, enjoy, most enjoyable part for me. So, um, yeah, Alina, you, I'm, I'm, you said you enjoyed it, obviously. Are there certain periods of music? I, I know you said you, you grew up as a pianist and also played the viola, but are there certain genres or... Um, er eras that you enjoy more than others? I can't say I know how to answer that question, but anything that's classical, almost kind of typical, I'm a huge fan of, and I, I could listen to it over and over again, but that brings me back to the conversation you and I were having about the silver lining mm. um, with kind of COVID and how that impacts the orchestra kind mm -hmm. of composition. So I don't know if you could share that because he mentioned the repertoire, you know, yes. being exposed to things we may not typically be exposed to. Yes, you mean the no, the no Beethoven. Yes, yes. I don't want to say it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, well, thank you for that. Um, yes, I have this reputation, apparently, of, of hating Beethoven, which isn't entirely true, um, maybe partially true. Um, no, I think that one of the things that we as the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra have an obligation to perform is, is, is the masterworks, as we call them, you know, Beethoven, Brahms, Mahler, and a lot of that repertoire just isn't a possibility at the moment because of the number of players that we need on stage, um, just those sort of limitations that we're, we're faced with during the pandemic here. And what it's really allowed us to do is put a, an emphasis on music that, that isn't recognized enough. And, you know, I think one question that I would have for Iggy after watching the program at home and knowing what it takes to put a program together for a live audience, Iggy is, is um, conducting, is, is directing the next Sounds of Resilience program on December 12th and is no stranger to putting programs together um, for the symphony and for other places. A lot of what we're programming might not be very successful in a typical two and a half hour performance with intermission with a live audience. Did you feel that at all with the performance this past weekend? Yes and no. I mean, you're always uh, worried about the timing of the pieces and the format and the, the, the thread, mm. you know, the thematic thread. So um, because those formats are somewhat different than the in-person performance standard, um, you have to kind of extend the repertoire or find other sources. But, you know, as long as you always find music that is beautiful or music, music doesn't always have to be beautiful, but it can be enlightening and interesting. And it, sometimes if you're kind of perplexed by a piece of music, but it makes you kind of ponder or think, you have a goal. I mean, you've, you've achieved something. Um, and, and, you know, the we're talking about, I don't know, 400 years of music. So we cannot possibly enjoy everything. And there's so much that we haven't performed, uh, especially, you know, the uh, 20th century music, 21st century music. Um, imagine everything we hear on the, on the pop radio, they play 20 times over the same song. You know, we have Beethoven Brahms that we've played many times over. And so we are very familiar with the music. but. A lot of the music we haven't heard, I think, sometimes deserves to have a longer shelf life so we can get accustomed to those new sounds. Uh, and I think this is a good format, this live stream, to offer things that you may not be able to offer uh, at a standard concert. So, um, but um, yeah, I mean, like you said, for the December uh, program, you and I have had to sit down and think about a few things. So uh, I know you've had to wear many different hats. And, and for just this particular concert in December, I've had to wear more hats too. And, and sometimes we crunch with time, we're sort of scrambling, finding uh, uh, good solutions. But uh, I think it's been a great success, very eclectic, uh, something for all palettes. And I'm very much looking forward to to the next one in December. I'm, I'm sure at uh, the Tuesday tuning up, we'll have uh, 
either guest artists, maybe a singer, maybe a horn player, maybe we'll have Anna again, or maybe an arranger, Michael, uh, I, you know, for those of you who don't know, um, Dave always uh, comes up with those brilliant guests, uh, as like Alina tonight, <laughs> and uh, so I'm looking forward to see who uh, Dave comes up with next week. He'll tell me usually two hours before the show. Well, that's uh, not fair. It's at least 24 hours. At least, sorry, uh, 24 <laughs> hours. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, very much looking forward to uh, extending this uh, Sounds of Religion into, uh, into December. Is that the reason why you picked Handel's Messiah for the December 12th? Because it kind of was originally written for a smaller group of musicians? So it's really interesting. I have this um, love-hate relationship with Handel's Messiah because <laughs> it's an Easter oratorio and we yeah. always play it in December, which is confusing to me. Um, wait, you know, wait, wait. So educate plus. It has three main parts. Three main and parts. what are the three different parts about? You it look is, like you know the answer to this. Yeah. It is basically the nativity part yes. of um, Jesus. And then the second part is about his, I guess, ministry mm -hmm. and crucifixion. And then the third part is about his resurrection and kind of this glorification of him for, you know, his life here on earth. So. Hence an Easter. Correct. Yes. Two out of the three of that is kind of Easter related. Yeah. And the hallelujah chorus that we so hear this time of year it's really foreshadowing something that happens a little bit later in the liturgical calendar, shall mm. we say. Um, and so I always have this, I mean, there's, there's many reasons I have a love-hate relationship with this, mostly because I've played it a thousand times at this point in my life. Um, and I have very opinionated views on Tempe and style and those sorts of things. Maybe you should conduct no. the concert. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. He knows how it should be done. <laughs> Absolutely. No, they're, they're, my, they're my opinions. And it's, it's really, you know, we, I think the other day you and I maybe joked about the historically informed, which is this way of playing music that um, you say, oh, this is how historically they did it. Well, yeah, they wrote books, but there's really no recording. So, you know, people tend to make and this is a very broad statement to make um, on social media, but that's what it's for. Um, sometimes we often make these very extreme judgments on how we per perform something, and too often times we say, oh, that's, it's historical. That's the way they would have done it. And we kind of use it as this excuse sometimes. I know I'm going to get tons of criticism for that, um, which I'm looking forward to. <laughs> Um, highly. Um, I don't know how we got here. We were talking about the Messiah and December 12th. Right. And I could, maybe because I was looking at the score tonight and the, the supposedly critical score or whatever. <laughs> um, but, and then I'm, I'm, I've been listening to recordings, but sometimes maybe I should ask you, Dave, I mean, seriously, because, you know, sometimes you have, I'm going to get a little technical, but if you look at the score, it just says, do, bom, ba. Bum, bum. But nowadays they do ba 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 ba. Is that what it is? What type of overture is it? It's a. <laughs> yes, it's a French overture, right? <laughs> and stylistically, a French overture would have been over dotted, which means that it would be a quicker sixteenth note pickup. But then. Okay, so I'm sorry, I'm getting really technical, but there are a couple bars, you know, maybe not in, in the overture, but in some areas where ta-tum, 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 and all of a sudden it becomes ton, 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 even eighth notes. So some scholars think that, well, he just wanted to save time, and mm. so it's still dotted than in the 16th, so it should ta-tum, 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 ta-tum. <laughs> Excuse me. But uh, I'm just, uh, being a conductor, you know, you start to kind of. Um, but, um, but then I, I did hear some recordings where, no, they do exactly as what is on the music, which is you have tom, 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 and all of a sudden, tom, tom, da, tom, da. What's your take, Dave? <laughs> My take is you always look at the, I, I think especially with an oratorio, you, you have text, you have the, the 
text is so representative of, of the rhythm so much of the time. And I think that in, in oratorio especially, um, yeah, it's a lot of lines, you know, they were using candles, those sorts of things. Um, I think that mistakes happen and that always relying on the way text is, is in the music is usually the right answer. So you can find the truth through the text. Yes. And in this case, the Old Testament or maybe the New Testament. Right. <laughs> yes. Well, that was a fascinating thing about bringing up on the, the Messiah because, you know, Handel wrote it for a, a smaller group of mm -hmm. musicians and then it's just evolved over time into this huge production. Uh -huh. um, and then apparently Mozart at some point thought he would contemporize it. Yes. And so, you know, it's, all, it's been subject to kind of these alterations for us to get to where we are today. Yes, the, the, especially the Mozart. Um, you know, there's timpani and horns and brass. And um, Sir Andrew Davis has written, who was the music director at Lyric Opera in Chicago, has written his own edition and I oh. believe recorded it uh, fairly recently with, I think it's Toronto Symphony. And yeah, it's something that has continued to evolve. Um, through modern time. Could we say the same thing for Vivaldi's Winter, right? Because we have the two winter pieces for the December 12th program. We do. Iggy, tell Someone us. Someone knows what's going yes. on here. <laughs> yes. Well, it's a great program, so I'm excited. Well, it, it was Sounds of the Season, and of course, uh, winter is the season. Um, uh, I think it's going to be a very, um, I, I, I keep using that word, but very eclectic program. Um, we had uh, Anna Lennard, our principal horn player, um, early on uh, this fall, she talked about her uh, Mozart horn concerto that will be performed, and I'm sure she'll be back here in the next few weeks. But uh, Alina, you were mentioning the winter. Um, you know, one does not introduce the Vivaldi winter season anymore. Uh, it's just so popular. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Vivaldi, not just for the music, but uh, wrote some sonnets, so um, some text into the music and so you know you have uh, the slow moon is beautiful it's about um, someone who's uh, by the fireplace inside of a home while outside it's uh, raining I, I don't know why I keep uh, thinking of raindrops and it makes me think of uh, bird back rack um, you know raindrops keep falling on the land. okay never mind um, <laughs> sorry, sorry let's just stick to the violin yes thank you um, uh, or or um, people uh, stomping their boots off the floor to get um, rid of the snow. Um, and it's combined uh, for that Saturday um, with um, uh, Piazzolla's own interpretation of the seasons. Uh, Piazzolla, of course, um, I'm sure there's nothing that I'm saying right now that you don't know already. Um, Piazzolla from Argentina, Tango composer um, was definitely inspired by, you know, Vivaldi. Um, um, from a composition standpoint, was influenced by, other than the tango music, uh, by Stravinsky. Bach was a very big fan of Bach. Anyway, um, that particular arrangement of Piazzolla's winter season uh, was arranged for violin and the string ensemble that you have by. Um, German, excuse me, a Russian composer, Leonard Desyadnikov. So I believe that it's very interesting because what Desyadnikov, in the winter season of Piazzolla, what he does, if you think of winter season in Argentina, which is in the southern hemisphere, winter in Argentina is summer in the northern hemisphere. So imagine Winter in, in, in Argentina is summer in Italy, where Vivaldi wrote his winter. So he actually quotes Vivaldi's summer season into Piazzolla's winter. There's a quote. So that's very interesting. You won't notice it because you'll be just uh, hopefully uh, drawn to the emotion. It's a very emotional uh, movement. I think Piazzolla's music is, can be very kind of a grip you. Uh, very strongly. So, but that's just a nice bit of trivia for those of you paying attention. So we have London, the Messiah. We have Italy. We have Argentina. Mm. 
what else do we have on the program? Hawaii. Hawaii, absolutely. That touch of home. That's right. A, a special request from you, Dave. From uh, me. I think it was, you thought it was very, very, very important. I, I, and it is. I did think it was very important. Uh, you know, we have, in the sounds of resilience, we've focused so much on expanding the classical repertoire. Um, and especially with the Halakulani as one of our sponsors, and of course, House Without a Key um, being closed and, until the renovation is completed, uh, we wanted to invite our, our dear friend Kanoe Miller uh, to join us for some performance. We've been trying for months now to, to figure out what it, it, what it would be, but um, Kanoe will be joining us on Hula um, alongside vocalist... Uh, Michael Lehman. Yes, thank you. He's practiced. Yes, absolutely. One more time for me. For Michael Lehman. Yeah. No, so it, it's very, it. very, very exciting. And the, the Hawaii Theater has beautiful Marley flooring. And so, uh, well, <laughs> not, I think for hula dancing, it's okay. You can dance on any type of flooring. But uh, it would be a first for those live streams to have, uh, we had singers. Mm -hmm. We will have singers. We had soloists. But the uh, first time having um, um, uh, hula dancing with the uh, With voice, the and she'll, she'll probably bring a ukulele as well. Yes. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I know they'll do a Christmas song, uh, maybe White Christmas. Yeah. And then the, the gem of Christmas uh, music, Meli uh, Kalikimaka, yeah. to finish the, uh, the evening. So um, looking forward to that and looking forward to... Uh, to share the stage with my friends. I was also hoping you guys could talk about um, the arrangements by Michael Fumai as well. Yes, absolutely. So this past week um, on the Sounds of Resilience, the Going Home Songs of Comfort, uh, we did an arrangement of Dvorak's Ninth Symphony, um, arranged, it, it's, it's had quite a legacy. Um, it was, words were, attached to this music by one of uh, Dvorak's students. And uh, this is, of course, the melody from Dvorak's Ninth Symphony, The Going Home, um, usually for English horn uh, when it's performed with the orchestra. And the performance we did was with baritone, Leon Williams. Um, and if you have not yet uh, seen the performance from Saturday night, it is on demand and uh, it can be found on the Hawaii Theater Center website. Um, and this particular piece, the Dvorak, will be coming your way, I believe, on Thanksgiving morning. We want, we were, I was just so tremendously moved by Leon's performance and by uh, the arrangement done by Michael Thomas Fumai, who's on the faculty of UH, uh, a wonderful composer. And um, I mean, his arrangements to me are just mind blowing. It is such a talent to take. I mean, can you, can you imagine, um, Iggy, uh, here, Dvorak wrote this. Do something with it. <laughs> That's right. He's a very quick, efficient, versatile composer. Uh, I think I mentioned to you before that uh, Michael uh, also plays the violin, uh, among other instruments. And uh, a long time ago, uh, was a student of mine at UH. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, he, he knew how to play the violin, and he was pretty quick, so... By the end of his uh, years at UH with me, we would just uh, read together some duos and duets, and, and, and he just wanted to have fun, and frankly, so did I. And so I, I, I remember, like, I had this whole book of tango by Piazzolla and for just two violins, and we would go, we would go through them. But uh, uh, Michael is one of many very, very talented uh, composers here in Hawaii. I, I, uh, I, Dave, I, I knew you. Maybe perhaps, uh, Lina, you remember the, the Symphony of Hawaiian Birds that, oh. that featured so many of, of our dear composers, Michael, Fumai, I'm going to forget, but Daniel Hoglum and Don Womack and John Magnusson, uh, Tom Osborne, Takuma Ito, and if I'm forgetting someone, just kill me. But uh, it was just a beautiful um, amalgam of, uh, of uh, Hawaii talent. And Michael is, has arranged a couple of the uh, holiday selections that will be on That's the right. performance on December 12th. 
I am looking down because I'm looking at the number of comments and questions that I have overlooked um, and want to get through a couple of these. First of all, we have uh, someone from Hawaii who is listening in Maryland and wants to make sure that you know. Oh, my goodness. I wonder so, who that is. Hello from, from, from Maryland. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, a wonderful uh, note here from Kanoe Casimero. The theater is still doing a stellar job of providing a great venue for entertainment of all genres. And I could not agree more. I've said it time and time again. If it were not for uh, the Hawaii Theater Center, Gregory Dunn, Donner Sonoda, Bob Dickerson, Spencer Augustin, uh, the entire team here, we would be lost uh, at the moment uh, in this time without the, the support of this entire team that makes these Tuesday night productions a possibility, but especially uh, our live performances. So thank you to all of them. Now, will there be more concerts coming after the next show? Yes. Can you tell us more about the associates? Uh, who joins? How much does it cost to join? I think there, there's an associate email address that people can write to. We really should have more information on the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra website about the associates, so yeah. that'll be coming soon. That'd be great. Um, briefly, anyone can join the associates, to my knowledge. Um, the annual fee is $35 for individuals and $50 for couples. And our email address is symphonyassociates at gmail.com. I manage that account, so anything that comes in, I'll be sure to get to. So send cool. us an email. Great, thank you. We might be able to drop that uh, in one of our messages uh, after the performance, or after the performance, the this <laughs> our, is our, 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 our performance here this <laughs> evening. Yes. Um, great, I'm just looking at it. Alina, I just wanted yes. to ask you um, something I asked to everyone who come to move to Hawaii when you. First of all, I think it's great that when you first came to Hawaii, you looked up the Hawaii Symphony, which is which is great. Um, what were your first impressions when, when you moved to Hawaii? Uh, my first impression was, man, there's so much potential with this group. Um, because I think when I joined, I was just hearing these mixed stories of the history of the orchestra. And... Um, you know, the associates, you know, there was an associates group with the previous symphony, the Honolulu Symphony Orchestra. Um, so they have this great knowledge. And I think I joined at a time where um, just a little bit of the anxiety was felt in terms of, you know, what's next for the orchestra, even, you know, a month from now, a year from now. Um, but then, you know, over time, especially, um, you know, with dedication, with kind of innovative and create creative thought, you know, you see the orchestra kind of evolve and sustain itself. So mm. um, it's just been amazing to see over the past four years, at least. I, I can't imagine how rewarding it is for some of the associates who've been around for 10 plus years. And you said your military family, but your, your, um, your family was never stationed here in Hawaii. No. And, and what was it feel, what did it feel like to, to like, you know, come to Hawaii? Oh man, it's like, Coming from the D.C. area, you know, it's hard to compare, like, swampland with paradise. Um, but it was somewhat of an easy transition being Hapa, as you mentioned before. Um, that kind of helped me integrate kind of into the community pretty easily. Um, but, of course, you've got your preferences that are a little different. You have to adjust to. And mm -hmm. sometimes it sits well with people. Sometimes it doesn't. And um, my husband made sure to lock me down early <laughs> in my arrival here. So... This is where I'll be for a very long That's time. That's great. And so as a, as a kid, did you move around a lot? Or yeah. did you also, were your parents stationed in, uh, on the, abroad? Or? Um, a lot of it was on the mainland, and then my dad did get stationed in Korea once or twice. Um, and that, that was good for me to kind of see that side of my you know, family. And um, fortunately, a few years ago, I got to go to Finland to, so I could you know, experience that side as well. So, Yeah, interesting because uh, I have... I had one student, um, military parents, and they moved to Maryland. And at the very same time, I had uh, another student, military parents, moved from Maryland to here. So, oh. yeah, it's very interesting. Sorry, Dave, I just... <laughs> <laughs> he just looks at me. <laughs> he just tees it up. Um, all right, we're, we're running quickly out of time here, and we are 
in the midst of a holiday week, which we touched on a little bit. And um, Iggy, who's cooking at your house this week? So what I was telling Alina and Dave was that um, my wife always cooks, and she's made turkey uh, many, many years in a row, and except for one year where being, again, when you grew up in France, everything is always overcooked, right? So you can be in France. If you have a steak, it's always like blue. It's not even rare, it's blue. Uh, anything more than blue is overcooked. So I complained that my, the turkey that uh, you would eat sometimes gets a little dry, right? So I decided to bake the turkey, uh, but I was the only one who ended up eating it because uh, it uh, had a funny translucent color. So uh, my, um, I'm, I'm very lucky that my, my wife has a big family, so my wife makes the turkey. I don't know if she'll make it this year. Uh, her sister's in town. My mother-in-law makes some great potatoes thingies. Um, my uh, auntie makes some sweet potatoes. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of food. So, um, you know, all kidding aside, I'm, I'm just very, very thankful. And pie? Um, pies, yes. And, and so the other thing about the French people is uh, there's, it's always too sweet when the French eat pies or dessert here in the U.S., it's always too sweet, and, and however, there's not enough butter. So if you go to France, it's more about the butter than the sugar. Uh, right, Corinne? Yeah. You agree with me? Um, there's, a, there's a French uh, a staff member here. And so that's why croissant, you know, croissant is just butter. Um, so the pies, yes, I enjoy the pies. I do find them sometimes. <laughs> Sorry, a little sweet, but I have a sweet tooth, so I'll eat everything. <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, Dave, uh, how is it going to be your thank you? Um, it's, it's going to be a busy week here. I'm, I'm hoping to unplug for just a little bit here and spend some time with my wife on, on Thursday. Obviously not, not going home, just staying home. Um, but, uh, you know, we've, we've, got, we've got a nutcracker coming up. We've got a made-for-TV Nutcracker on December 19th on KITV Channel 4 at 7 p.m. Um, and a rebroadcast at 8 p.m. on Christmas Day um, that we just found out about today. Um, apologies to the ballet. We haven't actually announced this yet, so you're the first to know. Um, but actually, you know, I'm really excited to be able to kind of delve into the Nutcracker this week. I have a cameo appearance as the father. Um, oh. Yes. Um, I am your father. <laughs> no. I don't think that's the version we're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, next year. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to, to really be able to bring this to the community um, with the orchestra that we recorded here a few, uh, just last week and, and all those sorts of things. So, you know, I'm, it, it'll be a busy week, but I'm excited to spend some, some time with my wife who will definitely do all of the cooking. Um, you don't want me to cook. Um, so, and how about you? What are your plans? Um, I'm going to have my in-laws over at my house. Um, probably not going to cook. Actually, no, now that I think about it. I was assigned stuffing from a box, and then I'm going to try cake from a box, too. So hopefully okay. those turn out well, because it can't get simpler than that. Yes, just remember, with the cake, no matter what the recipe says, it's all about the butter. Oh, yes. So just do the French way. Dis disregard anything the instructions <laughs> say, just more butter. Yes. Will, will the stuffing be inside the turkey, or will it be outside? I don't no, because I don't know if we're even having turkey. Right. But everyone right. just that's, loves stuffing. So, and because I know that sometimes it can be dangerous to have the stuffing inside the turkey, because you you check the temperature, knowing you know, by, by being undercooked, um, um, <laughs> you know. So you want to make sure the turkey is not undercooked, right? But often people get sick because the stuffing inside the turkey is undercooked too. So, okay, good tips. I think I'm done for about. <laughs> We have one more serious question that I want to make sure we answer before we go here tonight. What are the expectations of being a member of the Associates program? Oh, Have fun. Have fun. Be passionate. And it's really what you make of it. I mean, I had such a great experience because I kind of throw myself into it. Um, but even if you are contributing in a limited way, you're still going to benefit and be enriched by it. So I... Um, 
I highly encourage everyone to be an associate. It's a great time. Yes. And one more time, the email address it, is? Symphonyassociates at gmail.com. Symphonyassociates at gmail.com. Well, I always like to throw this question at people at, right at the end of the show. What, and you talked a little bit about this, but what's the future of classical music? What's the future of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra? I think it's starting with what you know you guys are doing in terms of programming and bringing that exposure to the variety of music that there is out there besides the masterworks. Um, I think you know people say, "Oh, classical music is a dying genre," and I don't believe that one bit. Um, but it's the work and the investment we need to make to um, show people the more contemporary pieces, the young um, composers and musicians that we have, you know in the world today um, who are still just as passionate about it as people who've been a patron for decades. So um, just pressing in on that and leveraging even technology, um, I think is the future. Great, what a great response. <laughs> that was wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It was, it was truly our pleasure, this little oasis that Iggy and I have here on, on Tuesday evening. It was a, a real pleasure to have you as a guest and to, to feature the associates and all the great work you do for the, for the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. Iggy, any final words? Um, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving. We're all very grateful for everyone's support, and stay safe. Yeah, we'll see you next Tuesday for Tuning Up, and thank you for all your support. Thanks to the Hawaii Theater Center, our entire production team here, and have a safe holiday. Thank you. <laughs>